This is a video lesson for AS Economics talking about the demand curve, the determinants of demand, and shifts and movements in the demand curve. The objectives of this lesson are that you can define normal goods, inferior goods, complementary goods, and substitute goods. You should be able to explain the four determinants of demand, and you should be able to explain how a shift is different from a movement in the demand curve. So the definitions we have to have. Number one, demand. Demand is the quantity of a product that consumers are able, to, able and willing to purchase at, at various prices over a period of time. I've added that emphasis on prices because really what demand is is not just the quantity that people are able and willing to buy, but it shows how much they're able and willing to buy at any given price, which is why it's a relationship which can all often be drawn as a curve and which is a downward sloping curve as we've seen before. The definition for normal goods are goods for which an increase in income leads to an increase in demand. Most goods are normal goods, and a good example of this would be Heinz baked beans. If you want to eat baked beans, Heinz is generally considered to be the best, it's the most expensive, and it's the sort of thing that if you have more income, you'll buy more of compared to, say, other brands of baked beans. Inferior goods are goods for which an increase in income leads to a fall in demand. A good example of this is Sainsbury's Basic Baked Beans. They're the cheapest ones on offer, and generally, if you have higher income, you're going to switch your consumption from these sorts of goods and focus them more on other sorts of normal goods. Complementary goods are goods for which there is joint demand. These are products that go well together, products that are used together. A good example of these would be tennis balls and tennis rackets. If you buy one, you're likely to buy the other. Substitute goods are competing goods. When you buy more of one, you buy less of the other. And for this example, we're going to use Coke and Pepsi. If you buy more of Coke, you're not going to buy Pepsi, and likewise, vice versa. We're going to assume in this presentation that there's no real difference between Coke and Pepsi, even though that is debatable. Right, let's think about the demand curve again. As we said before, it's a relationship between price and quantity. It shows that if we have a high price, very few people are going to demand the product. But if we have a lower price, we're going to see that more people do demand that product. That's simply because very few people have a very high value for certain products, whereas more people have a, a lower value for that, for that given product. And also, remember back to the idea of diminishing marginal utility. If you eat one Mars bar, you're probably likely to value it quite highly, but the second, third, and fourth, each one of them adds a little less value to the one that you had previously, which is why we have um, diminishing marginal utility and a downward sloping curve. We're going to look at the four determinants of demand now each in succession. The first one is consumer income. The second is price of complements. The third is the price of substitutes. Fourth is taste and fashion. Now the reason we're going to focus on these is because changing any of these factors will change the quantity demanded at any given price. That's a key because when we look at the demand curve, we see that it is a relationship between price and quantity, but changing any of these four factors will lead to a horizontal shift in the demand curve along those horizontal lines that we've seen there, which means that more of the product will be demanded at any given price. So changing these to mean more people want the product will shift the demand curve to the right, and changing any of those four factors to mean that fewer people want the product will shift the demand curve to the left. We're going to look at each of these now in succession. The first one is consumer income with normal goods. If your income goes up, what happens to the demand for normal goods, for example, Heinz baked beans? Well, think about this logically. If you have higher income, you're able to afford more of those sorts of goods that you want, so therefore at any given price, you're going to want more of them. Therefore, the demand curve shifts right. If you think about now normal goods with lowering incomes, if your income goes down, what happens to the demand for normal goods? Well, you have lower income, you can no longer afford so many of the things that you really wanted to have, and so therefore at any given price, you're going to have a lower quantity demanded, which means the demand curve shifts left. If we're talking about inferior goods, let's run the same thought experiment. If your income goes up, what happens to the demand for inferior goods, like Sainsbury's Basic Baked Beans? Well, you're richer, so therefore you can switch your consumption away from those sorts of things that you don't really want to have, and you're going to buy more of those things that you want to have, i.e. the normal goods. So therefore, as you get richer, the demand for inferior goods goes down. At any given price, you're going to want fewer of them, and so therefore, you have a leftward shift in the demand curve. Likewise, if incomes go down, what happens to the demand for inferior goods? Well, you don't have as much money, so therefore, you switch some of your consumption to those products that you don't want as much, but those are the ones that you can afford. So you buy more of those products at any given price, 
and so therefore you see a right shift in the demand curve. If you want a good example of this, look at what happened to Pizza Hut during the recession. Because people couldn't afford to go out to eat at nicer restaurants, the demand for Pizza Hut went through the roof. So the conclusion for consumer income. When income goes up, the demand for normal goods shifts right, the demand for inferior goods shifts left, and when income goes down, demand for normal goods shifts left, and the demand for inferior goods shifts right. The key to this is deciding if a good is normal or inferior to begin with. The next determinant of the demand is price of complements. So thinking back to tennis balls and tennis rackets, if the price of tennis rackets goes down, what happens to the demand for tennis balls? Well, let's think about this logically. Maybe there are people out there who want to play tennis, but they can't afford the price of a racket. Suddenly, the racket goes down, and so they're now playing the game. This means that more people are going to be demanding tennis balls, and at any given price, there will be more people in the market for them. So therefore, if the price of tennis rackets goes down, the demand for tennis balls will increase, and we see that it shifts right. If the price of tennis rackets goes up, the opposite happens. There are those people who want to play tennis, but can no longer afford the racket. So at any given price, there are fewer people who want to actually buy the tennis balls. Therefore, the demand for tennis balls goes down, and we see a leftward shift in demand. So summary for the price of complements. When the price of complements goes down, the demand curve shifts right. When the price of complements goes up, the demand curve shifts left. Looking at the next one, the price of substitutes. Let's take the two substitutes that we looked at before, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Pause your playback for a minute and make a hypothesis about what will happen to the demand for Coca-Cola when the price of Pepsi changes. If the price of Pepsi goes up, what happens to the demand for Coca-Cola? Well, considering that you want to buy one of the two products, you see that Pepsi is now a higher price, which would make you think that maybe you're going to go for the substitute good even if you weren't going to go for it before. Therefore, at any given price, more people want Coca-Cola, and the demand curve therefore shifts to the right. If the price of Pepsi goes down, what happens to the demand for Coca-Cola? Well, imagine that same person looking at the market um, at the supermarket on the cola aisle, and they see Pepsi, which has gone down, and Coca-Cola, which has stayed the same. And so therefore, they think to themselves, I think I'll have the Pepsi this time. Fewer people demand Coca-Cola at any given price, and so therefore the demand for Coca-Cola shifts to the left. So, as a conclusion, when the price of substitutes goes down, the demand curve shifts left, and when the price of substitutes goes up, the demand curve shifts right. We'll look at the last determinant of demand, which is taste and fashion. Now, I'm going to define taste and fashion as anything that will affect consumer preference for the product. Some typical examples would be, how cool is the product, just in terms of fashion and sort of you know, what's happening around town. How much good or bad publicity has the product received? This could be in newspaper articles or even just general trends. And how effective is the advertising for the product? We can use Levi's 501's jeans as an, as an example in this, in this slideshow. So, if the Levi's 501's suddenly become trendy, what happens to the demand curve for the product? Well, at any given price, there are going to be more people who value it at that price, and so therefore, the demand curve shifts to the right. Same thing again, if Levi's 501 suddenly become unfashionable, what happens to the demand curve for the product? Well, those people who wanted the product, and there are now fewer of them at any given price, and so therefore, the demand curve shifts left. So the conclusion is that the if the change in trend leads to more people buying the product, the demand curve shifts right. If the change in the trend leads to fewer people buying the product, the demand curve shifts left. Now, a really important thing that we need to understand is, the, is what's the difference between a shift and a movement in the demand curve. Now, if we see this demand curve here, as we said, it's the relationship between price and quantity and how much people are able and willing to buy at any given price. This means that if we know the price, we can draw it along the demand, we can draw out along to the demand curve and draw down to know exactly how much quantity will be demanded at that price. Now, a movement in the demand curve means that if we have a lowering of the price, We'll be able to draw that line a little bit lower, go out a little bit farther on the demand curve until we, until we reach it. So that when we draw it down, we're going to see a, a quantity demanded which is higher than the original quantity, Q1. What this means is, is that the lower price means that we move along the demand curve. 
which will mean that we have a higher quantity than we had before. We call this an extension in demand. Now the key thing here is the only thing that's changed is the price of the product itself. The demand curve has not changed fundamentally because no more people want to buy it at any given price. But, the, but because the price has gone down, we can see that there's a higher quantity demanded, and we call that, as I said, the extension. The same thing happens if the price goes up. If the price goes up, we can draw out another horizontal line to the demand curve, draw it down to see the quantity axis, and we'll see that with an increase in price, P2, there's a lower quantity demanded at Q2. So again, higher price from P1 to P2 means that we move along the demand curve, which means that we then have a, a lower quantity than we had before. We call this a contraction in demand, but again, it is not a shift in the demand curve because the fundamental relationship between price and quantity has not changed. We're only moving along the demand curve. So, before you, before you come back to class, look at the objectives of this video and ask yourself, have you attained them? Can you define normal goods, inferior goods, complementary goods, and substitute goods? Can you explain the four determinants of demand as we looked at um, just a minute ago? And can you explain how a shift is different from a movement in the demand curve? To make sure that you can test yourself on this, I'd like you to answer the following questions and also then look to the next slide because there's a summary sheet about the shifts for the price of complements and the price of substitutes at the very last slide. So if you could please answer these five questions. And then finally, as a bit of review, see if you can fill out this table here. As it, as it says, if the price of complements goes up, the demand, cur the demand shifts which way? I'll leave this up for about 10 seconds before I show the key to this table. All right, the key to the table is here. So for your next lesson, can you please make sure that you have those five questions answered? And of course, if there are any questions, please come find me or email me.